All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the September um, Clinical Research Connections meeting. Um, we do have a relatively full schedule today, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think up first, Lori Bloomberg Romero from UC Health is gonna speak to us with some research administration items. Thanks, Ben. I'll just show my screen here. One, did everyone to be aware that flu season is now upon us. And right now on UC Health's website, we have a listing of the available flu clinics that people can attend. Um, they are held Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays in the Bruce Schroepfel Conference Center. And these are walk-in clinics. I know there's been some confusion. Some individuals thought they could go into My Health Connection and schedule a flu shot. That's only for UC Health employees. However, you can go into My Health Connection and schedule a COVID booster or vaccination if you choose. Uh, they can be given in the same day, uh, different arms if you want to do that. And then anyone who had an, a vaccine exemption from 2021 does not have to submit for a new one. Your 2021 one will hold for 2022. On UC Health's website under vaccinations, there are other flu clinic schedules. If you happen to live in a location that might be closer to Northern Colorado or Southern Colorado, and those also have walk-in available options. Um, does anyone have any questions about flu shot or the expectations if you're in a UC Health um, facility or clinic? Okay, well, I will just remind everyone that the deadline is November 12th, and we thank you very much for adhering to this requirement. Thank you. Sorry, I do have one, one quick question. If sure. we get um, the flu shot, you know, like at a local pharmacy grocery store kind of place near us, is there, do we upload that somewhere online or send it to somebody, a copy That's of that? That's a great question. Yep, you can go to your local primary care or to any CVS or uh, facility that's providing the flu shot and then you would just simply send it to UC Health, UCH hyphen research administration at uchealth.org, which is also on our website under flu shot. That way you have um, the steps that you have to take. If you can't remember that, that's totally fine. You can just email it to me and I can send it over to our central box. And Lori, we don't have to send it to employee health. Is that right? If we're CU employees? That is correct. Okay, thanks. But if you do, they will also in turn forward it to us. <laughs> Any other thanks. questions? All right. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Uh, and then next, Allison Lakin has some updates from regulatory compliance. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have a quick, uh, if I can find my slide. Um, we've got a, um, on, um, Clin Wan is looking to do um, uh, some beta testing of e electronic e consent and is um is wanting a pilot matt i can't find my slide could you yeah i'll share it just one second um so i was just going to give a very um brief review of um of what Clin One is. Um, so they're a Part 11 compliant system. Um, it is hosted by Clin One, so you will have to download um, copies for your um, for your records. They do. You can do translation, so um, they have up to 60 languages. And normally, except for this pilot, um, you pay to use the system. But for this pilot, um, I, um, I think we can negotiate uh, this being done at, you know, by the, we'll figure that out, but you, there won't be a cost to you. Um, and generally, they suggest that it's a fairly fast deployment of the system. So that's one of the things I want to check into. 
next one. So um, the, what they say the system can do, do, and as I say, I don't have any reason to doubt it, but we have not tested it. Um, you can have multiple people involved in the consent process. Um, it does automatic uh, reconsent notifications to it allows for in-person consent, um, even electronically or remote by video. Um, you can bring in caregivers, translators, anybody who needs to be involved. Um, PIs can be remote from their phone without having to log in. And, um, and you can track, uh, obviously only, you can only track consents that are using that system, but you can track them across Cross systems. So, um, next slide. If you have a study that you're in the process of, you know, you're in the early stages of um, operationalizing and you are interested in beta testing e consent through Clin1, um, please, please reach out either to myself or to Matt and, um, and we can help you get set up. And is there any questions for Allison? Apologies, I think I was showing the presenter side, but. It looks like there's a question in the chat, Allison. It looks like um, Anita just has a um, evaluation tool. There's a question before that. Oh. Um, um, Gilchrist runs the 21 CFR compliance with REDCap. So REDCap is not, well, so the locally, the local instance of REDCap, which is hosted by the CCTSI, is not part 11 compliant. If you are using CPC's REDCap, it is part 11 compliant. But we do not have a locally hosted part 11 compliant REDCap. Now, Denver Health, um, asserts that their uh, red cap is part 11 compliant. We have not done the, the, um, the process for um, internally validating because of the way we use red cap. It's, it's really difficult to maintain part 11 compliance with our current instance of red cap. So that's a constant mis misunderstanding. Um, but there are instances of red cap around that are part. Yes, I. My question was just wondering why we, um, why we were to go in a direction of using a new system instead of using the e consent that's already the e consent module on Redcap. So um, we but again maintaining maintaining um, that as a part eleven instance is very difficult with the way we have the system configured. We would have to have another instance of Redcap. Um, and we currently don't have enough demand to go in that direction. So um, okay. we, thank you. That's, that's the reason why. And it doesn't give you the language issues and it is a little um, challenging to do it that way. So I'm, I'm looking to see if this is more user-friendly and um, allows us to think about e-consent in a in a more robust way. I have a question. Yep. So I'm about to start some interview sessions with health professionals. And these interviews uh, are more likely to be conducted through Zoom virtually. So I'm thinking about obtaining and in part informed consent verbally, and this will be recorded through Zoom. Would that be acceptable? Um, that is a question for the IRB to make sure that you have your consent process approved. Yes, this, this was part of my IRB application and it was stated in the protocol. Okay, and that, that process is not FDA regulated? Because it's um, right because it's not um, because it's not human subjects research. Um, it is human subject research, right. but it is 
but it's um, very minimal harm. Yes, and it's not under the it's not under the Part Eleven regulation. Right, and it's not um, investigation on new drug or mm -hmm. or um, or new drug applications. Yeah, so this is this is John. Um, that's that's fine for those types of studies. So Part Eleven is necessary for FDA regulated, and we have a different set of issues to deal with. Um, and um, if the research is minimal risk, if it doesn't involve PHI or HIPAA, then that also gives us more flexibility. So we can approve a verbal consent process. Um, uh, you know, if if we can approve a waiving documentation of consent. I'm not sure how we handled it in your particular study, but there are there are many more options for us to, to work with. Yeah, it's more of a behavioral science approach uh, that is um, that is you know casting this type of categories of of open ended questions and to and and research is kind of facilitating that um, dialogue. Um, between two health professionals in my particular study. So thank you. Thank you for that mm -hmm. validation and confirmation. Any other questions for Allison? Thank you. Thanks. And so next we'll move on. We have Allison McGrath here from EHS. Uh, and I think she's going to talk to us about some of the support services they offer. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, perfect. Let me share my screen. Go. Uh, no. Perfect. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Um, I know there's definitely some familiar names and, and faces on this call, but for those of you I have not met before, my name is Allison McGrath, uh, and I am the Associate Director um, within Environmental Health and Safety, and I'm here today to talk about some of the ways that EHS um, can support clinical research. Um, some of you are, are pretty familiar with us, and maybe some of you are not, and so um, we thought it would be a great time to kind of introduce ourselves. So as a, as a kind of just background and maybe information more on my side, we had just a quick poll um, I think Natasha or Matt, we're going to launch that. Um, just kind of uh, sort of taking the pulse here. How many of you had to reach out to EHS or have had to reach out to EHS before um, for, for any kind of a question? And if the poll is not showing up, let me know. I see it on my end. Maybe Natasha or Matt can see if the results are coming in. Yeah, the results are coming in. We've got uh, about 53 people answered out of 96. So 55% have participated. Looks like 35 have not used um, EHS, but 18 have. Perfect. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, since two thirds of you maybe haven't worked us with, with us before, um, just this presentation is really just kind of an overview of what we do. Um, and maybe how we can help support you in your research. Um, and I should note, I know um, this next, uh, see if it advances here. There we go. Um, slide is just our org chart. Um, so EHS does fall under um, Dr. Lakin. Um, so we are under uh, regulatory compliance. And I know you've heard from many of our um, peer departments like IRB and HIPAA and um, things like that. So we we are a little bit different in that our really our primary focus is keeping um, employees safe. And so we we don't do a lot of uh, patient safety. So I guess just full disclosure on that front, our our focus and, and really our mission um, is keeping employees uh, safe in their workplace. So um, I'm going to go over some of what our different divisions do here in just a minute. Um, but just so you can kind of see the, the sort of different um, background and experience that we have in EHS. And as I said, um, on that prior slide, really our goal um, is to protect all of you, to protect employees, to protect students, um, to make sure that uh, the research enterprise and the teaching enterprise of the university are, are protected. So um, we do a lot with researchers, especially in the, the bench type of research over in the research lab. And as the poll kind of alluded to, maybe less with some of the clinical researchers here, um, but then also other groups, um, police, uh, facilities management, and things like that. Um, 
And we we try to to do a lot of education and outreach things like this so that people know who we are. Um, we you know sort of pride ourselves on being a proactive organization. We're on every um, research committee um, here within the university. We work quite a bit with grants and contracts when there's new research being proposed. Um, and work with researchers um, in particular in writing letters of support um, if they are working on a new project. Um, and so before I talk about kind of what each of our divisions do and maybe where there's overlap um, with your research, um, we have one other poll question, um, Natasha or Matt, if you could launch that for me. Um, quick, pretty easy question. Do you have any of the following in your work area? Maybe a Sharps container, uh, chemicals of any kind, a DEA controlled substance, an investigational drug, maybe respiratory protection, especially with COVID. Um, we've had more questions about N95s than I think ever, uh, ever before, um, or any uh, X-ray or laser uh, based equipment. Give it a minute for people to answer here. All right, that's probably, if people were gonna answer, I'm guessing they have by now, so let's see. So 82% of folks that answered have a Sharps container um, for about 40% have chemicals. Um, quite a handful of you have either, more than half, either a DEA controlled substance or an investigational drug. Um, quite a few are working and, and have respiratory protection present. Not so many on x-ray or lasers, um, but either way of, I don't know how many people answered, maybe Matt or Natasha can chime in there, but either way, you know, of those that answered, many of you do have um, one of these things, which can have an EHS um, sort of component to them. So um, I'm going to go through these next couple of slides fairly quickly. Um, and they're just an overview of what our different divisions do. So for all of you that answered yes, we have a Sharps container. Our biological safety group is a group you should be aware of. Um, I guess I, there maybe could have been a third poll question here in terms of physical location, because I know some of you are um, located here on the um, university side of the Anschutz campus, and some of you are working at maybe um, a satellite location or um, at like a partner institution like over at UCH or Children's. Um, so, so maybe someone else is taking care of your Sharps containers, but if you are here on this campus, it's our biosafety group that's coming by and picking up those Sharps containers. Um, and then subsequently have uh, training available because anyone who's working with those types of, of materials should have bloodborne pathogens training. Um, to be compliant with the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard. Um, our biosafety group is, is part of the IR, uh, IBC, so the Institutional Biosafety Committee. Um, for those of you that are offsite, again, they also coordinate with our vendor who picks up biological waste, um, either a Sharps container or like a red uh, tub. Um, and then they do shipping um, permitting for biological materials. So again, with um, clinical research, there may be less on the um, biological um, material permitting side, uh, but it, it may still be relevant for some of you. So just wanted to make note of that here. And I guess I should say, if anyone has questions as we go, feel free to chime in and interrupt me, um, or I can take them at the end, whatever's easiest. Um, our HAZMAT group, again, for those of you that have DEA controlled substances or investigational drugs, uh, this is the group that will come by and uh, pick those up um, if they're being disposed of. For DEA controlled substances, the um, permitting sort of process and, and having a DEA registration is pretty complicated. And our HAZMAT group um, is an excellent resource to make sure that you are um, registered the correct way and that your registration is applicable for your uh, research location um, because DEA does come visit campus pretty regularly. Um, and, and so it is important to be compliant with those uh, requirements. Our occupational health group um, is over in the health and wellness center. So really a useful resource here in terms of employee onboarding um, for clinical research, you know, probably folks that are interacting with patients or for sure collecting um, samples, um, needing to make sure that their um, immunizations are up to date, like things like Hep B, um, maybe TB testing is required um, before someone starts and, and uh, things like that. So um, they also can do medical clearance if folks are wearing respirators and do um, regular medical surveillance for folks working with hazardous materials as well. This slide is very busy and I apologize in advance. Um, our radiation safety group has um, quite a bit of overlap with the uh, clinical um, side of things and obviously clinical research can, can have um, a fairly significant radiation safety uh, footprint. So I just wanted to include all of these potential items 
um, to kind of give you an idea of some of the areas where our radiation safety group may be a really important resource. Um, not having the correct licensing for uh, radioactive materials or equipment that generates uh, radiation can be um, a pretty significant uh, violation with the state of Colorado. So if you are going to be working with any type of x-ray equipment or doing things like fluoroscopy um, and things like that, make sure that you reach out to us. Um, we've had um, a handful of new kind of clinics um, or clinical research with some um, sort of emerging technologies. And, and there are quite a few applications that can um, involve um, radiation or radiation safety. And then the last group um, within EHS is research safety and industrial hygiene. Uh, this is the group that I manage. So um, maybe you have a bad odor or something in your workspace. I feel like odor um, and indoor air quality response is probably the, the most significant overlap with each of you because anyone that works for the university should have a safe um, workspace. And so we want to make sure that, you know, if someone's working somewhere and they notice a strange, you know, odor, and we actually have an indoor air quality investigation going on um, related to clinical research over in building 400. So um, we're, we're the folks you want to call if you start noticing kind of a, a strange or unusual odor. Um, we also certify fume hoods. Probably most of you, if you're working with uh, biological specimens, might have a biosafety cabinet, but some, some folks do have fume hoods, so we can check on those. Um, and we do other types of air sampling for uh, hazardous chemicals if people are working with those types of things. Um, and then finally, our group does all of the uh, respirator fit testing. So if folks are wearing N95s, um, we can do fit testing for that and make sure that they are truly being protected. Um, and, and so thinking about how we might work with, with each of you um, in your work, you know, we, we have important uh, partnerships with several different groups. Like I said uh, earlier, uh, folks working offsite, um, over at UCH or Children's. Um, we also have some researchers that we work with down on the uh, Denver Health Campus um, and these other groups like facilities, uh, various schools and colleges and the uh, uh, University Police Department as well. And more, more specifically, you know, what are the things that you all should be aware of in terms of how you can work with EHS? Um, the first is just to be aware of general training requirements. And I'll talk about those in a, a, a minute here. Um, but for, you know, for new personnel, or for existing personnel, if you're uh, obtaining new equipment or maybe taking on a new protocol, making sure you understand what training is required. Um, contact EHS if you have new employees starting and you're not sure what training um, or maybe medical clearance they need before they get started. Um, let us know if someone's leaving. Uh, there are some protocols where we do um, sort of an exit, um, either occupational health interview or other testing, just to make sure that we've kind of closed the loop on um, regulatory requirements. Um, and then finally, reporting spills. Uh, accidents or injuries to EHS. And on each of those, especially on the training piece and the reporting piece, um, really the, the framework that we operate out of is um, starting with uh, regulatory requirements that we have to meet for training and reporting, um, some of our funding agency policies, and then institutional standards. Uh, most of you are familiar with, with the uh, funding agencies listed here. Um, we generally are the group that sort of interfaces with a regulatory body when they come to do an inspection. So um, they're welcome to show up unannounced and, and meet with researchers, but they usually do reach out to us. If, if anyone ever shows up um, at your, uh, maybe at your space and they're coming to do an inspection, call us and we're happy to come and um, sort of be there present for when the inspection occurs so we can help answer any questions maybe that you're not sure of. Um, and, and generally, we, we have a good working relationship with um, the inspectors that, that come from these groups, especially, like I said, DEA is pretty frequent um, and CDPHE at the, at the state level. The funding agency standard, um, and, and really the main one that we mentioned here is the NIH grants policy statement. Probably several of you, maybe all of you are familiar with this document. It's about 400 pages long. Um, and we all just like to point out that there is this specific health and safety regulation guideline section. Um, and there's quite a bit there about uh, the OSHA bloodborne pathogen and exposure control section, which is likely the one that's most relevant um, for all of you. And then this last one down here, um, the NIH guidelines, if folks are working with recombinant DNA. Uh, a few reminders about then our institutional standards. Um, there is a university policy statement on the code of conduct, which specifically calls out EHS in terms of developing and implementing a comprehensive safety program. 
If you're not sure how to go about um, maybe implementing that at your workspace, call us. We're happy to come by and meet with you and make sure that you know what training um, and what PPE is, is required for that type of space. Um, in the lab areas, specifically food and drink aren't allowed. We help um, if there are gonna be minors volunteering in the lab or working in the lab. And again, if you have questions on that, please contact me. Um, we love having students on campus, but we all wanna make sure that they're safe um, and working in an environment that um, is suitable for their age. Um, and again, occupational health I mentioned earlier, uh, essentially, occupational health enrollment is required for most types of research, especially if there's um, any work with biological materials um, or things of that nature. So again, I think that the sort of resounding message here is if you have questions, call us. Um, we, we want people to know that we're around and we're here to help. Uh, this is a, just a quick overview on training that we have available. Uh, most of them are available online through Skillsoft, and the one that's that's probably most relevant here for all of you is the bloodborne pathogens training. It is required annually, and that is by that OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard. There is a state, uh, Colorado CDPHE Department of Public Health and Environment, um, requirement for regulated medical waste. So for folks that are generating uh, waste that goes into like a, a biohazard bin or sharps container, there's a um, additional training, and that one's only required once every three years. Um, and there are other specific trainings available depending on the nature of your research. So despite um, everyone's best effort, accidents happen. Um, again, we're here to help. Um, this is just a, a quick screenshot of our website. And you can see that there is a spills and exposure reporting button on our website. Um, if you're not sure what to do, contact us. Um, calling or contacting us via university police is, is certainly probably the fastest way. Um, and that extension is 44444. Uh, four, 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 four. Um, and they're able to um, call us. We have an emergency response pager. So there's always someone on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, to help and, and make sure that any um, scenario is responded to by EHS. Um, and then there is a workers' comp reporting piece, which is handled through risk management. Um, and I'll, I'll have a bit more information that, on that here on this next slide. So um, just a summary, and, and this is probably a, a useful slide to share again with like new researchers or new personnel coming on board. Um, again, if it's an emergency situation, call uh, 911 or go to the closest urgent care. Um, if it is a bloodborne pathogen or potentially infectious exposure, the um, UCH infectious disease uh, travel clinic over in the Anschutz outpatient pavilion is the best spot to go. Uh, but it is best to call um, this phone number listed here in advance before you go there. Um, risk management also has quite a bit of information on their website about designated medical providers, which are providers that fall under our workers' compensation plan. Um, and then just a few notes about a specific, you know, specific types of exposures. I don't need to read each of those, but um, these are the types of things that employees should be aware of, um, especially if they are handling um, hazardous materials or biological materials. Um, and there is this useful resource called a pathogen safety data sheet. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with chemical safety data sheets, but probably more useful for, for some of you to know that there is um, such a thing as a pathogen uh, data sheet, which is, you know, useful if, if that's a type of material working with. And then finally, just the sort of um, specific details on reporting a, an injury or exposure through risk management. You basically have, basically have four uh, business days to report, um, and there is an additional form that's required, which goes to our biosafety group. Um, if it was a material um, or the incident involved a material um, that was a biological hazard. And that stems back to the NIH policy um, document, uh, which requires us to report um, basically a, a reportable incident to uh, the NIH. So the takeaway message um, really is just to say hello. Hi, uh, I'm Allison. I am EHS. We're here to help. Um, we want to make sure that when people are, are again, maybe um, have new employees starting or maybe they're starting a new project, have new equipment in a new space, you know that uh, we're a resource you can call. Um, we have a lot of subject matter experts in our department. Um, we've got folks that have run research labs before. We have a Berkeley trained chemist. Um, we are happy um, to partner with you on, on the science of your research. Um, and it's something that that makes us excited about being here every day. So. We love to hear from you and, and please reach out if you need help um, and, and help us help you. Um, we don't know what we don't know. If there's um, maybe folks offsite, off campus, working in a space that, that doesn't have the right EHS support, let us know 
um, so that we can partner with you and, and can visit you um, and make sure that everyone uh, everyone has a safe space. And with that, this is my dog wearing safety glasses. Um, I am passionate about PPE and uh, safety, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have now um, or free, feel free to contact me um, via email later as well. Allison, there are some questions in the chat. Awesome. I can pull it up and just work through them if that's easiest. Okay, that's good. Perfect. So I see the first one was from um, Jamie. Can you tell me where we can get refill biohazard bags? Yes, um, I can send a, I'll make sure I uh, take a, a snip of all the chat questions here, but um, Mark Garcia in our group should be able to get um, refill biohazard bags or tell us where to find them. So I'll, I'll follow up on that one, Jamie. Um, and then I see another one from Michelle. Um, if we have clinicians working on a research study involved in stressful traumatic event, is this something EHS um, would assist with? I Maybe, Michelle, if you can chime in, I just making sure I understand the question correctly. Um, it, it sounds like maybe these the clinicians are hearing from participants that were involved, or there's a stressful traumatic event with involving the clinicians. Yeah, so most likely what would happen would be, because we work with some medically complex um, individuals and most likely what would happen is there would be some kind of emergent health event in which they'd have to respond acutely, call 911 and kind of run through that whole process. And it's just, you know, we're not emergency physicians, so it's not something that we see every day. Um, and so sometimes those come up, it's pretty rare, um, but it's not a situation that necessarily everybody is prepared to cope with after the fact. Yeah. So I would say, um, on our staff, we don't have, for example, um, someone that maybe would be able to like counsel them on the event itself. But certainly, um, in dealing with first responders or, or you know having having to sort of interface with um, maybe groups that would be you know the sort of like on call um, folks, we, we would we have good relationships, for example, with like Aurora um, Fire and um, you know University Police. I don't know if you are are on campus here um, or somewhere else. But, um, you know, I think we probably could connect you with the right types of people, if not. Um, and that's a great, you know, sort of secondary question um, and thinking about maybe who would be the best um, on sort of the, the follow-up. We, we do things like after action reports when we have emergency situations and maybe it's um, useful to think about how we could incorporate that model um, for folks doing research like this. And I saw one more. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it just popped up. There we go. Um, do you have materials related to facility and compliance that could be used in sections of the NIH grant proposals? Uh, yes, um, we have a couple of different checklists um, for sure um, on the sort of facility safety side of things. And I'm, I'm again, I'll take a just a screenshots here of all the questions and your names, and I can follow up with each of you separately about some of those materials. Any other questions? I don't see any. Ah, question. Uh, this is Doug, the dog. He recently turned eight. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your time, and um, I hope we get a chance to work together soon. Thanks, Allison. And just confirming, I think our second speaker may have been caught up, um, and I don't see her. Melissa and Del. Um, Anita Walden, are you on? I am on. Do you do you know if Melissa's? Uh, let me let me check really quick. I know she's traveling. Um, okay. Hold on, let me check to see if I can catch up with her. Okay, thanks. Let's just give it a minute. Let's see. Any other questions, general questions for anyone who's on the call? And Ben, it might be a great time maybe to take polling uh, in chat of future topics if anybody wants to add future topics that they're interested in hearing about, or um, if you think of something afterwards, 
the email address, I'll put it in chat. It's just clinical research connections at CU Anschutz. But if you have any ideas of topics that you'd like to hear about or presenters that have come on, but it's been months ago that you'd like to hear from again, please let us know. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, Anita, if we're not able to get a hold of her, we can always reschedule for um, Melissa to present at another meeting. Okay, I just text her. Um, I know she's in a meeting, um, but you yeah, haven't heard back from her yet. Okay, well, I think she was probably planning on talking for at least 20 minutes, so... Um, I don't know, Matt or Natasha, what you think, but maybe we'll just give it a minute. If she's not able to join, we can reschedule her for, a, for another time. Yeah, I would say let's go ahead and reschedule. Um, ben, there are a few comments in chat about potential topics. Maybe we could just go over those with the group and hopefully that will um, spur others to share some other thoughts or ideas that they may have for potential topics as well. Um, that's always helpful. Sure. Yeah. So I see we have one for stat support resources on campus for clinical research. Uh, and I know there are there's multiple resources available for biostatistics support. So we can add that to an agenda in the future. And then um, protocol development resources on campus, especially for studies that need an IND IDE. Um, and that is a good question, Haika. Um, yeah, we can we can talk about that and and, and present at a at a later meeting on what there is. Anybody else have any ideas or things that they see as um, potential topics for future meetings? Oh, external IRB process in the future. Well, I think Natasha put the email address in the chat as well. If you, if anyone thinks of additional items that they want to have discussed at a future meeting, um, feel free to email the Clinical Research Connections at CU Anschutz email address. Uh, I got, yeah, something about IBC reviews. I think that's that is also a good one. Not everybody um, engages with the IBC, but it would be good to have them talk about the types of studies and when they need to be involved. The SMBs, that's a good one as well. Over, oh, sorry. Overview of third-party recruitment tools, that would be a good one as well. I think um, we can certainly add that to the discussion in the near future. RDRC versus non-RDRC regulated research. Well, I think let's go ahead and, and call it there. Um, we will reschedule Melissa to talk at a, a future meeting. If you do have additional ideas, free, feel free to reach out to us via the email address. Um, but I don't want to keep you any longer, so we'll give you 20 minutes back. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>